Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval, terms apply. Hey there, working listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. One of the greatest misconceptions about acting is the idea of playing a character. Every character we're going to play is already inside us. But most people don't know themselves well enough, and they say, oh, I would never do that. What would make you do this? What would make you say this? Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Ronald Young Jr. And I am your other host, Isaac Butler. Isaac Butler, here we are again. Yes. Glad to be here with you. Thank you. Yes, glad to be here with you. So who was that we heard at the top of the show? That was the voice of acting teacher and acting coach to the stars, Howard Fine. Ooh. What made you want to talk to Howard right now? Well, I have really wanted to interview more acting coaches because it's a somewhat mysterious field. But actually, you know, there's often acting coaches working with actors on movies, sometimes on set, sometimes not. And I just thought it would be fun to talk to someone. And since he has a new edition of his book on acting, which is called Fine on Acting, uh, coming out soon, I thought this is a pretty good time to chat him up. This sounds like it's going to be an awesome conversation, but I'm assuming that you don't have all the fun now. What can our Slate Plus members expect? Mm, Indeed. So there have long been acting coaches, you know, going back to the heydays of the studio system, and they have long had a very contentious relationship with the directors of the movies they've been hired to work on. You know, most famously, Marilyn Monroe's onset acting coach, Paula Strasberg, would do stuff like cough during takes if she thought they weren't good enough, you know? (laughs) So I just wanted to ask Howard about that relationship and, you know, who does he actually work for, the actor, the director, the studio, you know, how does he navigate those kinds of collaborations? Wow, that sounds very contentious and I'm already interested in hearing it. And if you're a Slate Plus member, make sure you stick around so you can actually hear that part of the conversation at the end of the show. If you're not a Slate Plus member, you can sign up today at slate.com slash working plus. You'll get ad-free podcasts and bonus content like the segment Isaac just described. You'll also get full access to all of the articles on slate.com. Also, if you become a Slate Plus member, you'll be supporting our work and the work of everyone at Slate. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. All right, now let's listen to Isaac's conversation with acting coach Howard Fine. Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. Earn up to 3% daily cashback on every purchase every day. Then grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. Howard Fine, thank you so much for joining us here on Working to talk about your process. Happy to be here. So let's start with perhaps the most basic of questions, which is when you're at a party and someone says, hey, Howard, what do you do? How do you answer that question? I will say I'm an acting coach. And if they don't know anything about it, they'll say, how do you teach somebody to act? Right. Yeah. Because people think that because great acting looks easy, that it actually is. Right. Because the kind of almost the final level of that skill is making it look like you're not doing anything. Right. A hundred percent correct. 
So before we get into your present day, who trained you? What, what do you think of as your lineage as an acting teacher? I went to college and graduate school and had formal training that way. Mm -hmm. But my lineage began in high school when I stumbled into an acting class. And that high school drama teacher could have been at any college. He just happened to be in high school. And he taught from Uta Hagen's first book, Respect for Acting. So before I finished high school, I had three years of doing all of her exercises. And we would take trips into New York City. I grew up in Rhode Island to watch classes at her studio. So I was already very clear about what Hagen taught. And then in graduate school, I had one of her protégés as my main teacher. And then later, after I became an established teacher, I met her. I had never studied with her, only with people who trained with her. Uh, and we became fast friends. And I brought her several times to my studio to teach master classes. So my lineage very strongly is Uta Hagen derivative. Got it. Now, you know, Uta Hagen, obviously one of the great 20th century teachers of her version of Stanislavski technique, I think is probably the, the broadest That's brush. Right. But um, how would you describe the essence of Uta Hagen's technique and particularly how it might differ from some of her peers in the 50s and 60s? She was practical. Mm -hmm. She didn't present herself as a guru as the way, the light, right. <laughs> the only path. She thought it was practical, and she was constantly, almost as a scientist, re-examining things, mm -hmm. because she was one of the few people who had an equal skill as an actress and as a teacher. Some people who teach acting, who failed as actors, who are bitter, uh, wish to get up and demonstrate constantly how they would do it to the students. That's not great teaching. Great teaching is not having your own ego get in the way, but help someone else do what they do. And let me give you a Hagen example. Great. She was teaching at my studio, and an actress was working on Blanche from Tennessee Williams' Streetcar Named Desire. And she said, oh, Miss Hagen, I'm so nervous doing Blanche for you. And Uta said, why, dear? And she said, because you played Blanche. Right. And Uda said, darling, that was 100 years ago. Who cares what I did? Let's see what you do. Right. And that gave that actress such a present at that moment. So what I loved about her is she was not, she didn't make herself the imperial teacher. If, if she walked into a room and people applauded, she told them to stop. We're here to work. Amazing. So I, that's what I loved about her. It was practical. And that's why she wrote her second book, A Challenge for the Actor, because she felt she could do better. She had learned more. She was clearer. She was constantly re-examining herself. So you mentioned, uh, you know, there's the acting teacher who's the failed actor, and then there's the acting teacher who's also a great actor, and then there's also the acting teacher who really actually teaching is what they really want to do. How did you figure out that you were more a teacher than an actor, given that you spent so long studying acting so seriously? Well, you have to study it as an actor, you have to, in order to teach it. But it's akin to the greatest coaches in sports. Very rarely are the star players the best coaches. Right. It happens, but it's rare, because for the most of them, they can't get past their own ego to help someone else find who they are. And so can I function as an actor? Yes. Was I great? No. And in high school, my drama director spotted a directing talent and he gave me Edward Albee's The Sandbox to direct when I was 16. And I felt something else happen when I was helping others. And luckily, I, if I had any smarts, it was not to run away from what I was good at. I had a sense that I can do something special when I direct and when I coach that I can't when I act. So I went to my strength. I didn't run away from it. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the core exercises and techniques are that are kind of the foundations of, of your method as you've, you know, yes. adapted uh, Hoggins? Yes. And I, I've tried to make it work for television and film and to make it work when you have to work quickly. Mm -hmm. But first, my first step of my eight steps is who am I? And I think of that I as standing for identification with the role. 
One of the greatest misconceptions about acting is the idea of playing a character. Every character we're going to play is already inside us. We have to learn how to access that. The most common acting mistake is judging the character. And that's why I don't let people speak about a character other than in the first person, I. Because you have to find yourself in every role. But most people don't know themselves well enough, and they look at a character's behavior and they say, oh, I would never do that. And the first thing I teach them is that's a nonsensical point. It's not about what you would do. What would make you do this? What would make you say this? And then I teach people to use both their own real experiences and their imagination. There's a schism in the acting world, as you know, yeah. between the Meisner people who lean only to what if or the use of imagination and the Strasberg people who tend to be only sense, memory, emotional recall. And I say, why would you want to work with half a toolbox? You have to use your imagination. I hope to God you don't pick up a script and look at it and go, oh, I remember when I was kidnapped. Uh, I hope not everything has actually happened to right. you. You know, sense memory and emotion memory, the the use of sensory details of the past to call up intense emotional responses has been very controversial since it was, you know, first introduced in the 1930s because of the possibility of traumatizing people, because of the possibility of becoming an unlicensed psychotherapist, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. How do you use or teach people to use their real life, often very difficult experiences in a way that you feel is responsible and ethical? Sure. Well, I teach this. If there are experiences that you have never been able to talk about, not to your best friend, not to a therapist, don't use it. Mm. When I teach emotional recall, I do not, when I give a personal example, use the, the death of my parents or my eldest brother. I use the death of my grandmother. It still brings up personal pain, but I can come back from that. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what to touch and what to leave alone or leave for a professional. However, let me pose the flip side. Is it any healthier to say, what if my brother died? You're going to unlock all of your worry and paranoia that way as well. Mm -hmm. So whether you use imagination or you use a real experience, it's going to cost you. That is an occupational hazard. Now, there's unhealthy, where people are going to places that they've never examined, that they should take to a mental health professional. That's unhealthy. They're staying in it after you have worked. That's unhealthy. You have to have a process for coming out. I have a student who's done a lot of painful characters on Broadway, and she has a ritual. When she takes the costume off, she says good night to the character and puts it to bed mm. and says, I'll see you tomorrow. Before she goes out and signs autographs or meet anybody, she puts the character to bed. So you have to find your own personal rituals for coming out. But whether you're using imagination to pose all sorts of painful scenarios to yourself or you're using real experiences, it's going to cost you. We don't want to ignore real experience. Let me tell you why. One of my students was cast in an independent film where his character was sent away for anger management issues. That really happened to him. Hmm. So what is he supposed to say? What if I got sent away for anger management? What would that be? He knows. You know, there's this very funny New York Times magazine double profile of Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler in the late 70s as they've sort of gotten more dogmatic you know, and uh, there's a part where a student of Stella's is for a scene supposed to stare out a window and see these lakes in Switzerland. And Stella says, you know, what what were you working with? Right. And she says, oh, I've actually been to these lakes. I've seen these lakes. And so I'm, you know, using a memory of these lakes. And she said, no, you must use a fictional lake you know, to engage your imagination. She did not. You know, she really didn't want people using real experience at that point. Which, how can you ignore... That you've seen the real it, lake. Or if you've lived it. Yeah, totally. So right. we don't want to ignore real experience. And we don't want to ignore imagination. We want to use both. You know, the thing that always hampered me as an actor, and I should say I was an actor in high school. Uh, you know, I, I did it a little bit after college, but not really. Um, 
is the thing that Stanislavski so beautifully calls public solitude, right? The act of appearing unconscious of the audience, whether it's the movie camera or the the people in the room, right? Just, just really not caring that they're there. And I think anyone who's watched a lot of TV and film know that some actors are really good at that and some actors aren't. How do you train people in not being self-conscious? Well, first of all, the word itself. Self-conscious is consciousness of self. Right. So you're worrying about yourself and how you're coming across and how you're doing. Yes, that this is, is my problem. Extension. <laughs> <laughs> it's an extension of ego. Mm-hmm. And if we start worrying about how we're coming across and how we're doing, we freeze. If I'm thinking right now about what you think of me, I will freeze. But if I focus on attention off myself onto you, I'm fine. We learn to concentrate on our circumstances, on our relationship in the scene, on who we're talking to, on what we want. And the minute anybody can become self-conscious at any moment means the attention has gone to you. I teach people to take a breath and refocus immediately off themselves Mm. on what they want. Another thing that we learn to do is to create a fourth side of the room so that when you're acting, you're able to be private in public whether that's audience or camera, I'm imagining the fourth side of the room. Now, do I know the audience is there? Yes, but it's what you choose to focus on. Mm. You teach the foundations of, of your technique, right? On top of your, your other duties. So what are the really common kind of foundational problems that people are often working on in your class? The most common acting mistake is psychoanalyzing the character. Oh, my character's a narcissist. The minute you do that, you separate yourself from it. The other thing is we get so many people who think because it looks easy, it is easy, and they don't have the work ethic, the discipline. I think with YouTube and influencers and the advent of quick fame in so many different ways. You get a lot of people who have no idea what this is, if they have an aptitude for it, if it's even their passion, who decide, okay, I'm going to do that. And I will give us a bit of advice. Have you auditioned at least three times for people who do not know you and been the ones selected? I don't care if that's student film, even in your community theater, anything. Get real before you decide that this is the thing that you are going to do. Because, again, as you know, Isaac, 98% of the Actors Union of SAG is unemployed at any one moment. Right. And so what makes this a wise career choice? It's not. It better be your passion. If it's not, do something else. Right. I mean, acting is incredibly tough. I mean, that was one thing that I figured out when I was in college because I've been a professional actor as a kid. And then in college, you know, I was doing a lot of shows. and I was like, I'm actually not tough enough to do this. That was the thing that I, I luckily learned pretty early on. Not emotionally tough to go to those places and then come out of it, you know, and not tough enough to deal with all the rejection. Constantly. In what other profession do you have to apply for your job constantly? Right. Now, Acting teachers have had lots of various techniques for helping their students gain that toughness, right? The woman who first taught Stanislavski technique in the United States, Maria Ospinskaya, she did it through, you know, really brutally taking people apart in the room because she wanted them to be able to withstand anything. And supposedly, privately, she was very sweet, and it was really a performance on her part. I get the sense that's not what you're like in the room. No. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you, I'm not the teacher in Whiplash. Though. Right, 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 right. And Maria Spinskaya kind of was, you know. Um, yes, that's right. Um, and certainly her immediate students, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler, kind of took those ideas of what an acting teacher was supposed to be. So if you're not going to do that, if you're not going to, you know, beat the person up until they grow a shell, how do you help them be tough enough to do this job? Well, they have to have some of that in their own makeup. Mm -hmm. However, I can teach them that my job is to be accurate. There are two extremes, as you know, with acting coaches, the person who's trying to kill you. (laughs) And then the everybody gets a trophy for participating. That doesn't help either. 
So the job of the acting coach is to be accurate, to be clear, to be specific, to give you notes that are usable. Do some people hear me as harsh? Yes, some people do. And it's not my bedside manner, and I'm not trying to do that. But I am accurate. Right. I will ask when somebody is done with their work, what worked, what didn't, and why. I ask what worked as well as what didn't. Because the, I want the artist to find balance, to be able to look at what they do well and look at what needs attention. Both. If you don't have that balance, you don't have the recipe for success. I was traveling, so I didn't get the name of the child psychologist who said this, but she said such a wise thing. She was asked, what do children need in order to succeed later in life? What are the raw materials? And she said, insecurity. Mm-hmm which makes people work harder, (laughs) balanced by a feeling of being special, which makes you think you can. And I think that is what every artist needs. You have to have some insecurity because without insecurity, you don't work. Balanced by a feeling of being special, which allows you to feel you can do it. You know, that's interesting. Whether you're in the theater world or the film world or or anything, because our listeners are in all sorts of different jobs, getting and receiving feedback is a huge part of your life, right? And in yes. the editing world, in the writing world, the standard technique is something called the shit sandwich. And the shit sandwich is you begin with praise, right? Then you give them the shit, you know, all the stuff they did wrong and all the stuff that you need to fix. Then you end with a kind of pivot to this is going to be a great piece, you know, when this, 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 and this happens, that's the shit sandwich. And people use it because it works, right? You know, uh, is, is that, you know, when you're thinking about structuring your feedback or giving notes in a way that someone can actually hear them, because if they can't hear them, who cares, right? Uh, yes. You must think a bit about your performance and how you structure those notes. I do. I, I try to stay really balanced, really clear, and I have them record my notes mm. so they can listen calmly later. Right. Because sometimes you're having an out-of-body experience when you're getting those notes. Oh, yeah. And so that way they record it. When they're calm, they can listen. They will then hear that I probably said something positive, which for most people will not compute at that moment. But You want to be able to take notes without defensiveness. And that is another major problem. If somebody's defensive to notes, if they have this comeback, well, the reason I did that was because this. And the reason I did that, and I'll say, okay, I'm giving you directions and you got lost. And you look at me and say, why did I get lost? And I say, well, you should have taken a left, not a right. And now you come back and say, yeah, but the reason I took a right, what I know, but take a left. Yeah, but I took the right because... I know, take a left. (laughs) And so often, if somebody has those issues, but they've had those issues their entire lives, it's not just in the acting class. One of my favorite quotes is by a speaker named Ayanla Van Zandt. She said, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. I find that 100% the truth. So if the person is organizing their life not to be able to take input, That's been a lifelong pattern. That's not just right now. Right. We'll be right back with more of Isaac's conversation with Howard Fine. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, the supply chain has been a friend and foe to my company. Can AI make us more resilient? Signed, Supply Chain to Uncertainty. Hey Supply, here's how AI in the supply chain can help. AI can massively automate data analytics and understand the movement of your goods. AI can point out weak links, market demand trends, optimal logistics, and other important aspects that impact the top and bottom lines for the business. 
take the example of a large grocery chain that has hundreds of vendors spread through the country. In some cases, you may need to reroute shipments to other stores, such as in the case of fresh produce, a good that can go bad very fast. Managing such a supply chain is heavily dependent on the data provided and AI can help optimize this information so that your supply chain works at its optimal levels. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com AI to learn more. Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. Earn up to 3% daily cashback on every purchase every day. Then grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we wrestle with creative challenges and try to provide our best solutions. So what are your creative challenges? Let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, back to Isaac's conversation with Howard Fine. When did the private coaching startup as part of your practice? Here in LA, I was teaching a class before I had my own studio at another studio and An agent sat in on the class, and she was sitting in to watch an actor. She didn't like the actor, but she liked me. Mm. And she was representing Paul Stanley, the lead singer of Kiss at the time. And Gene Simmons had already done some acting, and Paul wanted to go into it at that moment himself. And he needed a coach. So she sent him to the three top coaches in L.A. and me. Mm. (laughs) And I'm sitting in my living room, and he pulls up in his Porsche, And he did a smart thing. He brought the same material to each coach. It was an audition for a William Friedkin movie. And after I got done working with him, he said, well, you're my guy. And I said, okay. Anyway, I coached him on it. He auditioned. Friedkin stopped him and said, that was amazing. You must be training. Who are you studying with? Oh, this new guy, Howard Fine. Well, then that's all Paul needed to hear. He invited me to his bowling birthday party. And I was bowling with Sarah Jessica Parker, Robert Downey Jr., all the members of the Brat Pack, and I'm this celebrity acting coach. And then came Diana Ross, and and it just started to go. So I didn't even know there was such a thing. Mm. It wasn't in my goal of what I want to achieve. It just happened. And and how does working with someone one-on-one as a coach differ from, you know, the kind of classwork and scene study and things like that you do? In class... I will allow someone to fail because I'm the ultimate judge. If they come back and I give them, and my students could get angry at me because I'll, I'll help them just enough to send them into their next rehearsal. If I solve it, if the teacher directs, the actor doesn't learn. Right. So I give enough to help them, but if they fail, they fail. If I'm coaching somebody, for example, I coached Austin Butler on his performance in Elvis. If I, I don't do that well, (laughs) their career hangs in the balance. So I help a lot more in a private coaching session than I do in class. And and how early into the process does an actor usually hire you? Like just Austin Butler and Elvis, for example, right? Like I assume there was a long lead time in his preparatory process for that role because he's playing a real person and everything. Did you come in pretty early in that? Oh, yeah, because he's a longtime student Mm -hmm. and he was in classes ongoing. And I helped him with his audition for Elvis which, by the way, was Tennessee Williams' Orpheus Descending. Incredible. How smart of Baz Luhrmann, because a non-actor can't do it. And right. Austin had been in class for years. Then we worked on Iceman Cometh. And then he got great reviews. Then came Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So by the time he had done all of that, Orpheus Descending, he could handle. So when you were helping... 
Austin Butler prepare for Elvis, you've got obviously this template of a real person, right? And so, you know, were were you all sitting there like sort of like a coach watching game tape, you know, of, of Elvis to figure it out? Or, you know, I how did. did that, what was the research and assemblage process of that role like? We both knew as much as we could about Elvis's life, even things that were not mentioned in the script. The thing to, two very important things. If Austin had done an imitation of Elvis, he could have just signed up for a job in Vegas because his career would have been over. It right. would have been career ending. So when you're playing a historical figure, you have to research them, obviously, but then you have to find where that character lives inside you. Mm, yes. It has to connect. But I, I love to give an example. The same year that Philip Seymour Hoffman won an Oscar for Capote, there was a second Capote. Yeah. Okay, that was a better imitation. Philip Seymour Hoffman does not, did not resemble Capote in any way. He's a much bigger guy. But he found where it lived inside him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an imitation. Right. And, and then the other thing you have to know when you're playing historical figure, it's not just the historical figure in general. It's that writer's take on that historical figure. You could have two scripts about U.S. President John Kennedy. One sees him as the greatest president who ever lived. Another sees him as a philandering husband. Depends on the writer's take. So you have to ultimately look at that writer's take on Elvis. Mm. It's not just Elvis. There's something subjective in the writing. Right, right. Now, obviously, you know, there's a thing <laughs> in the acting process that sort of gets introduced by Robert De Niro in the seventies and then gets taken up by actors like, uh, Daniel Day Lewis is very famous and you, you know where I'm going with this of really extensive physical transformation work, sort of, uh, very elaborate preparation. Like, you know, Daniel Day Lewis famously built his own house for the crucible with period tools, uh, you know, things like that. And then of course, um, not breaking character while on set, um, you know, remaining in this in this place. And uh, I just love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, have you ever worked with people for whom that was their process? And how do you work with that if that's happening? How do you help people learn to set it aside, you know, et cetera? Yeah, I, I don't advocate the extremes. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to have mental health here. <laughs> and you can easily get yourself into a nervous breakdown. Now, should you spend part of your day in character? There's a German television series that I love called Babylon Berlin. Great show. Oh, God, you know it. Yeah, yeah. No one knows that show. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the lead actor, Volker Bruch, yeah. when he was first cast, it's set in Berlin in the 1920s, late 20s, before they even knew whatever was going to happen. When he got cast, he started putting on a suit every day because his character is always in a suit. Then he got the fedora hat, started to wear that. Then he got the straight-edged razor, and he learned to shave with it. Then he started putting on the music of the time and learning the dance steps. That's fantastic right. homework. That's smart. And well, so, because you want to master the behavior of the character, right? Of like course. you have to look like you know what you're doing with this. If you have of a course. scene where you're shaving with a straight razor, you have to look like you know what you're doing. That is exactly right. Yeah. So that's all practical. You want to do that. When I worked with Will Smith on a movie called Concussion, where he played Dr. Bennett Omalu, Dr. Omalu is also a living person who performs autopsies. In the movie, Will is performing an autopsy as Dr. Omalu. He observed Dr. Omalu perform two autopsies from beginning to end. And as he described it to me, it begins with a diagonal slice across the cadaver. He almost passed out watching it, but he had to watch it because in the movie, his hands had to be educated. So that's good homework. That's correct right. homework. You want to do that. But if I'm playing a homeless character, do I need to spend a year on the streets? No, that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So there, there's the bounds of mental health here. You work with actors who work on both stage and screen. Uh, I think people aren't always aware of how different those jobs actually are, even though they have the same components. Among other things, in theater, you have to be able to sustain a performance over a long yes. period of time yes. and keep your inspiration during that time. In film, it's stop and go, and it's out of order, and you have to be able to come up with that inspiration on demand. How do you teach people to navigate those two different challenges? 
I find if somebody has a stage background, they can adapt very easily to television and mm. film. It's why we tend to see those folks at Oscar time. Right. <laughs> because if you can sustain longer scenes, you're in shape to sustain shorter scenes. The theater is the most exposing thing that an actor can do because there's no editor to help you. Right. And you either have the chops or you don't. <laughs> and I find that the theater actors develop concentration in a way that somebody who's just on television film, they do not have. Now, do you ever, as a private coach, are you ever helping someone whose background is almost entirely in film and TV transition to do stage? Is that a job? Yes. What, what, I mean, you don't have to name names. I'm just curious yes. about what <laughs> yeah, that... that. I have to be careful with yeah. that one. So <laughs> Thank who, you. who really fucked it? No, uh, ah! no, 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 more seriously though, you know, what, what is that process like when you're running this in reverse? You know, when it's someone who's used to, who may be very talented, it's not about them not being talented and not being dedicated and everything. It's just their background is in these short bursts yeah, of it. Yeah. I ask them to start, to start with meditation every day. Oh, wow. To learn to make themselves still. And I'll say, start with a minute. Because just to make yourself still and to begin to focus and then work that muscle up. The other thing when we're working on the scenes is a thing I call continuity of life. The end of one moment is the beginning of the next. Right. And they have to learn to keep their inner life within the circumstances of the writing and not about how to do the scene right or well. And so over time, it's a muscle as any other muscle. It has to be stretched out. Not easy for some. Yeah, totally. I mean... It, that reminds me that even if you're not an actor, if you're not interested in acting, the tools that acting teaches about being present in the circumstances of the character's life can be very useful for being present in the circumstances of your own life. Acting as a hobby is the best thing you could ever do. <laughs> as a career, it has its downsides. Right. I had a businesswoman contact me and say, you know, I want to take your technique class. I'm not an actor. I'm not interested in being an actor. I just want it for interpersonal communication. I think it'll help my confidence. So I said, you know what? Sure. Well, she did incredibly well in my class because she didn't have an agenda. She wasn't trying to win an Oscar tomorrow. She just loved learning. Mm. At the end of class, she said something that did not make her popular in the room. She said, you know, you say the same things all the time. Why don't they get it? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody looked at her with hatred. Right. But she was just taking the lessons on, growing, no agenda to be perfect, to achieve something. Therefore, she got the lessons and it really helped her. Mm. The revised edition of your acting technique book, Fine on Acting, recently uh, was published. Your workbook that accompanies that is about to be published. Um, Throughout the history of acting, acting teachers have really struggled to write well about their their techniques. Uta Hagen, in fact, is one of the very few. Uta Hagen and Bobby Lewis and are, are two of the only ones who ever wrote about acting well who actually taught it. So can you talk about um, that challenge and how you kind of attempted to write about this very ineffable thing in a way that's actually readable and useful? Yes. I became a better teacher by writing the book. Because if you're going to put it in print, you better make sure you absolutely believe it. Uh, and from years of testing things out in the classroom, I've honed my explanations. I've gotten more clear. And I try constantly to be very conversational. In fact, that's how the book came about. We did a series of interviews and then transcribed those interviews. And then from the interviews, I wrote. So it really helped me speak directly to the reader. And now with the new revised book, I've also recorded the audio book. Oh, great. And so I stand 100% behind what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Howard Fine, thank you so much for joining us here on Working and uh, sharing your process with us. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Absolutely my pleasure, Isaac. Thank you so much. Coming up next, Isaac and I will talk more about realizing and running towards your strengths, as well as separating from and finding kinship in characters. So stick around. First, 
the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. What's the best way to learn a language? Immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that is with Babbel. There was a time when I spoke Spanish pretty well. I spent a couple of years living in Spain, but that was some time ago, and I haven't really been using it intensively since then. So I wondered if Babbel could help me revive a language, or if it was just for beginners who needed to gather really essential skills like asking for directions, talking to shopkeepers, or ordering food. Well, I have to tell you, it was really useful. I enjoyed the kinds of conversations that Babbel prompted me to have. The structure was appropriately complex, but it was all connected to situations I could imagine arising in real life interactions. Babbel is generally designed by real people for real conversations. The tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real life situations and delivered with conversation based teaching. So you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. And here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash working. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash working. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash working. Rules and restrictions may apply. Isaac, I really enjoyed that conversation. I, I think Thank one you. of the best parts about listening to that was finding out that there are a bunch of great actors out there and it's not just raw talent. Like they're not out there just being good at acting from the womb. I'm not saying that there aren't exceptionally great people who were predisposed to be good actors. Sure, those people exist. But to know that there's people out there that are very good at their jobs because they train really hard, something about that feels really good, especially for the folks that are getting to the highest levels of accomplishment in Hollywood. It says a lot about the value of a good coach. One thing I noted was that Howard talked a lot about running towards his strengths. Once he understood he was a better coach or director than he was an actor, he started kind of turning in towards that so he could do more of it, which I think requires like a remarkable sense of humility and self-awareness. So I'm wondering if you'll talk a little bit more about that idea of moving towards your strengths when sometimes it's in the opposite direction of your aspirations. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I agree with you that, you know, it takes a certain amount of guts to be like, well, I know I wanted to be an actor, but actually the thing I'm good at is is teaching acting and I'm going to learn how to get my fulfillment from that. You know, um, I feel like I sort of went down this with becoming a writer because I had been a director. I had trained to be a director. I've been directing plays since I was literally in high school. And, you know, I had sort of been writing as a hobby and then in my 30s went to graduate school to kind of flip those two things so that I, I became a full-time writer. And some of that was just about the kind of life I wanted to have and everything. But also writing was going better than directing. Like, I still like to think I'm a good director and I, I miss doing it more often. But the truth of the matter is, is that you know, what, uh, what the universe wanted from me or whatever <laughs> was my writing, not my directing. And so I had to learn to take a different kind of, you know, professional and creative pride in that, whereas it used to be this hobby. It was just this thing I did in my spare time and I didn't really care about it. Uh, and now I care very deeply about it. You know, it's very fundamental to my identity. So I think that, you know, part of what it comes out to is like what kind of life you want to lead. And I think that can help you make those kinds of decisions. So for me, it was, you know, my, my then girlfriend, now my wife, we wanted to get married. We wanted to have a kid. And I realized that even if I was a successful director, the kind of successful director I was going to be was the kind who was on the road six months out of the year. And I just didn't want to do that. And so once I realized that as a writer, I could have the kind of life I saw myself leading, 
that was really helpful in making that transition, you know? And so I don't want to speak for Howard. I don't know exactly what his journey was, but you know, it's like if you're, you know, if you love acting, but you really hate auditions, <laughs> you know, if, if, if that's like a excruciating ego death for you, um, maybe that's part of you telling you, you should be pursuing something else, or maybe you just need to go to an audition coach. But I'm just saying, you know, it's like the, the, if you look at the life you're leading, I think you'll find the actual career you want in response to that. I think that's a really mature way of looking at it. And it, I don't think it's something that most people like most people are short sighted. I don't think they're thinking that far ahead in terms of like the life that you actually want to live. They yeah. imagine one that's kind of further out, but they don't mix it with their present state. And I think to do yeah. that and to take your next step is like remarkably mature. <laughs> so <I'm>, well, <laughs> I had a really good therapist, uh, but I also think that like it, it is also I tell my students this all the time because a lot of times they're about to graduate from college and they're like, what the fuck do I do with my BFA in acting? Like, yeah. what am I going to do? And I just just tell them like it's okay to not know what you want to do you're 22 years old like you don't actually have to know all that stuff yet i like the way that you're looking at that but that wasn't the only time that you came to this type of realization <laughs> <laughs> was it like you mentioned that you oh, came yeah. to the realization that acting specifically wasn't for you and it was said you said it was because you didn't feel emotionally tough enough to yeah. do the job can you talk a little bit more about that experience like what was it like to come to that realization was it hard was it sudden it was very sudden, actually. Um, for people who've read my book, The Method, How the 20th Century Learned to Act, in the introduction, I make a very vague reference to a difficult acting experience in college. Uh, so now I'll describe it. You're, you're getting some bonus uh, introduction content here. I love it. So, um, you know, it's two weeks into freshman year of college, which is, you know, that's like a pretty depressing time anyway, you know, when you're sort of like lose sight of yourself and having lots of difficulties. And I got cast as the lead in this Eric Bogosian play, Talk Radio. And uh, in that play, the main character chain smokes cigarettes for 90 minutes and then has a nervous breakdown on stage. You're, he's like, he's a shock jock, right? And then at the end of it, he has a nervous breakdown live on air. So, and you're on stage the whole time. You really don't have a break. And so I was smoking real cigarettes. I Yikes. was chain smoking real cigarettes. I smoked 10 cigarettes a day at the time, half a pack a day. I was very regimented about that. And I smoked 15 cigarettes over the course of this show. Oh, no. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> drinking Coca-Cola that's like subbing in for coffee, you know, because he's always drinking coffee. I'm chain smoking these cigarettes. And then I have this nervous breakdown at the end of the play. The play was directed by, you know, two college students who weren't even theater majors. They just liked the play and wanted to put it on. And so they didn't know... And this is no fault of theirs. They didn't know how to coach an actor into those difficult emotional places. So I started using the like kind of serious, you know, training that I had had because I studied acting very hard in high school. But, you know, I knew enough to like get myself into that place, but not enough to like get out of it easily Yikes. or to manage it once I was in it. And so, you know, I just was, and it was also beginning of freshman year. I think most people at the beginning of freshman year kind of hate themselves anyway. Right. And so I'm like digging into the most depressed self-loathing parts of me. And I'm just like, Oh, digging it all out. And then it's just all coming out during this like two page long speech. And I'm making myself physically ill from the cigarettes, right? I mean, yeah. it was horrible. People would tell me they you were, were a time bomb. <laughs> yeah, my friends were like, I'm really worried about you, man. Are you okay? And I would go home to my dorm room, a seven foot by 11 foot center block, you know, rectangle coffin. Yes. And I would just stare at the wall for like an hour until I came back down to normal. And so when this process was over, I was like, if this is my life, I'm going to go insane. I'm going to actually go insane. Yeah. Like it's not, it, you know. And so uh, I changed my focus to directing immediately after that. Um, the funny part of it was, you know, when I called my parents, my mom listens to this show, so she'll probably dispute this. But when I called my parents to tell them this, I was like, I don't think I want to be an actor anymore. Uh, I think I want to focus on directing. It was like um, what I'm told coming out of the closet is like. They were like, are you sure? <laughs> is it is it just a phase? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we support you, whatever, whatever you want, sweetie. So, you know, yeah, I love that. I, I love that you kind of undersold emotionally tough when you were talking about that. That sounds like you were pretty tough emotionally. It just like you knew not to be, stay on that treadmill forever, which I actually really commend you. Also like auditioning really. I mean, I mentioned auditioning earlier. It yeah. just, it made me feel so awful. Like, yeah. you know, 
it's weird because actors, you know, they really only have, they have the text and themselves. That's like all they have. And so there's a certain amount of self-involvement and self-consciousness built into it. And I could see that that was turning me into a bad person. Mm. You know what I mean? That level of self-involvement, like that's part of the toughness is not being able to handle that. Whereas I have lots of friends who are professional actors and like they are, you know, there is a self-involvement that's part of that. There has to be like to do your work, Yeah, but they're very good at like, you know, really trying to, to get around that and beyond that and be normal human beings. And I just don't think I would have been able to, I would have gone Hollywood weird without uh, going to Hollywood. I'm really glad you know yourself that well. You you know, uh, Howard mentioned at one point that actors shouldn't be psychoanalyzing or judging the characters that they're intending Mm. to play because it creates a sense of separation that makes acting harder. He mentions that because he says trying to find a character in yourself, if you're too busy dwelling on the ways that the character is different from you, it makes that finding, makes that search more difficult. But Isaac, you write a lot of nonfiction, and I imagine that that separation of writing about real people and real scenarios often has you examining yourself in a particular way. Do you ever feel a sense of separation or even kinship to the folks that you write about? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, that was a really fascinating part of the interview, because just a couple months ago, I interviewed Patrick Page for this podcast, and he starts with that kind of psychoanalysis. You know, like when he played King Lear, he actually figured out what to him, you know, he did some research into it. What form of dementia does King Lear have? Because there's a lot of different forms of dementia. And the symptoms of that, the one that he found were really helpful for figuring out how to play the character. So it just goes to show you there's lots of different ways to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, But for me as a nonfiction writer, you know, it's interesting. This question of how much you judge the people in the thing you're writing about is a really important question. And I don't think there's a right answer. I think there is a right answer for the work that you are doing. So, for example, like Janet Malcolm, who's a hero of mine, extremely judgmental of the people in her nonfiction. And then her judgments about them becomes one of the subjects that she is thinking about on the page over the course of the piece, you Mm -hmm. know? And so um, that's not really how I roll. uh, I would say I do sort of approach it like a dramatist, like what is this human being and what makes them tick? The thing that I really try to avoid is jargon language, Mm. right? So for example, you know, I'm not going to say, so-and-so was an abusive narcissist. That's jargon language that sort of doesn't mean anything. I mean, it does mean something, don't get me wrong, but that's so much less interesting than finding an example from their life that you can dramatize, and then you don't use those words, and then you have the reader go, huh, this guy sounds kind of like an abusive narcissist. Do you know what I mean? So yes. it's like, 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 like that's the part that I feel is like the dramatist in me is always trying to figure out like, what is the telling detail or the incident that illustrates and gets you to know this person? Whereas if you use labels, the reader doesn't actually get to know them. The reader just gets to know the label you've put on them. I think that's a good rule in life, honestly, to just think about like what the, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, there's a conversation I had with a friend of mine, Laura, who says that she stopped calling people toxic. She started saying that people create toxic dynamics because she says right, the labeling yeah. of the person is like the most more damaging part. So I, I like that you're you're creating that rule to get that separation for them. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I wouldn't use the word toxic until it had been described enough that the person has an experience of it. And then like 50 pages later, I might be like, like their toxic interaction in 1967 or whatever. So the reader's like, oh yeah, right. I remember what, you know, like I only use it. Those labels are all a shorthand. So you should only use them when you need a shorthand is how I feel about it. I like that. All right. That's all the time we have for today's show. But before we go, just one more reminder that if you join Slate Plus, you'll get to hear all of our episodes ad free. You'll also get to hear exclusive segments on our show and a lot of other Slate podcasts, and you'll get full access to all the articles on Slate.com. You can sign up today at Slate.com slash Working Plus. Special thanks to Howard Fine for being our guest this week and to Kevin Bendis for supplying us with some extra research help. This show is produced by Cameron Drews, who needs no coaching whatsoever. Uh, We'll be back next week with a conversation between Ronald Young and playwright Becca Brunstetter, who recently wrote the book of the forthcoming musical version of The Notebook. Make sure to check that out. Until then... 
get back to work.